welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hey folks and welcome to episode 81 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. This week we talk to Kimmy and James from the Catamaran SV Zingaro uh, and share their story about their last uh, three to four years sailing together uh, in lots of really interesting locations uh, around the world, in the Pacific in particular. Uh, but then in the second half of the episode, we drill into their most recent uh, challenge. Uh, we're at sea uh, in some pretty heavy seas. Uh, their catamaran, uh, one of their cross members broke, uh, causing their one of their two catamaran hulls to become detached from the main bulkhead of the boat uh, and how they coped with that in uh, 20 foot plus seas and how they managed to keep the yacht afloat uh, and, and be able to wait until the Coast Guard arrived. Uh, and then uh, I won't spoil the punchline, but but what happened after that? So it's a great episode. Uh, they're a couple of great sailors. Uh, they've got some excellent resources as well online uh, on via our YouTube channel, via Instagram, uh, via their website, and via Patreon. So I'll, I'll post the links for those uh, in the podcast page uh, on the website at oceansellingpodcast.com. Uh, I'll also give you those links at the end of the episode as well, so you can go check them out. So. Uh, enjoy this episode, which I recorded just this morning, actually, uh, live on their uh, yacht uh, in Hawaii. So on the personal front, I've had a busy few weeks. We competed on Ocean Gem in the Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. Started on Boxing Day, finished on the 30th of December. Had a fantastic race, extremely challenging downwind most of the way. Uh, we, unfortunately, despite... Uh, been in a great position in the fleet, uh, probably in the first third of the race. Uh, we uh, we just destroyed our ability to use our code zero on the first afternoon. Uh, two of our three spinnakers uh, on the second evening, and uh, had to continue the the balance of uh, a largely downwind race with just one. We see our lightweight spinnaker, uh, which we managed to keep in one piece. Um, and then we had a really challenging final 40 miles uh, across Storm Bay and up the Derwent in really light patchy conditions. Uh, but we had a great race and. Pretty happy to finish uh, fifth in our division in IRC, I think a division of maybe 12 or 15 boats. Um, we were in the hunt for quite a long time uh, for a top three finish, but uh, lessons learned and uh, plans to be bigger, better, stronger next time, uh, next time I do the race. So look for an upcoming episode on that. I'll get the crew together on Skype and try and record something. Uh, but we had a great, great time doing the race, great time in Hobart afterwards. And um, I'm now less than three weeks away from departing Hobart to circumnavigate uh, Tasmania, uh, 800 miles around the coastline of Tasmania. So looking forward to that, uh, late January, early February. Um, so uh, in, in between trips, uh, squeezing in a couple of episodes. Uh, so enjoy this episode number 81 uh, with James and Kimmy. James and Kimmy, thank you so much for uh, thanks for contacting me, uh, and thanks for uh, sharing a bit of a bit of an insight into your your recent adventure um, with your catamaran. And um, it's really exciting to have you on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. And uh, I, I guess before we uh, dive into your most recent challenge, I want to I've had spent a bit of time on your website and on your YouTube channel, which is pretty amazing. Um, and having a, had a bit of a look at the your last three years, so uh, so do you want to just I mean, where, whereabouts? Do you want us to explain for everybody whereabouts you guys are right now? Uh, we're in Hawaii. We're in Maui. Uh, mm -hmm. We're on a ball outside of Lahaina. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And uh, do you want to just uh, describe uh, Singaro? What sort of what sort of vessel is she? Uh, she's a 1984 Crowther Spindrift catamaran built in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. by uh, one man in his backyard. He did a really, really nice job building her and she's taken us over 25,000 miles. Okay. How'd you guys get started with your sailing? Uh, I bought the boat in 2016 and I left from Florida and uh, went to Cuba and then went to Mexico. Uh, I think I stopped by Cayman Island on the, on the way and um, I met Kimmy in Mexico and we've we've been together for almost three years now mm -hmm. and 
we've gone from Mexico kind of down the Central American route. Uh, we hopped over to Jamaica, went through the canal. Uh, we went north after we got through the canal because we really wanted to see an island called Isla del Coco, which is part of Costa Rica. And so we went all the way up to the border of Nicaragua and then down to this island that, um, that was actually the island that Michael Crichton based Jurassic Park on. Oh, wow. Super cool island, lots of tiger sharks and really just wild. Mm -hmm. um, and then we went over to Ecuador, spent a bunch of time in Ecuador and refit the boat in Ecuador to, to do the Pacific crossing. And then we did the adventurous route to go down and go to Easter Island and Pitcairn. And we got really blessed by um, weather and we got to see all the four islands in, in the Pitcairn group. And we got, to, we got to stay in Easter Island for 34 days. So we had a really magical time and got to meet a lot of the locals and we loved it there. Mm -hmm. And then we just kind of dipped down and went through the South Pacific, went, went up to the Tumotus. And we want, really wanted to see Hawaii and winter in Hawaii. So we, uh, we decided to come up here and see the line islands in between, which is a hard sail from Fanning Island to Hawaii, but worth it, totally worth it. Uh, Kiribati was amazing. Okay. And um, Kimmy, before you jumped on board this sort of crazy adventure, have you done much sailing previously? Um, no, not at all. I I think I spent like one afternoon on a boat before that. I did make my little um, optimist license though on Lago di Garda in Italy. So okay. more like a summer vacation thing. Mm -hmm. um, but this was the first time on a catamaran and um, yeah. I'm enjoying it a lot. In Mexico, okay. I was backpacking, so doing something completely different, basically. Mm -hmm. But it's great. And okay. I hope we'll continue. She said she was going to stay on the boat for a month, and I'm still trying to get her off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's a good sign. Um, and um, I mean, for you, Kimmy, what what have you found the the most fascinating and, and, and challenging about moving off the land and onto a sailboat permanently? It's being far away from home, I think. Um, it's tough at times. And obviously, um, now being away from home, I think, must be the hardest challenge. Mm -hmm. And what, how do you keep in touch with um, your, your family and friends back home? Rarely at all. I'm, take, I'm taking a plane back home like twice a year, and that's when I'm catching up. But internet connection on the places we visit, like Kiribati or the Two Motors, it's just sending emails takes like half an hour or something. So there's just no no joy in like talking back and forth and it's it's barely possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and what, what have you found the most enjoyable um, about the, the things you've done and the, the places you've been? Because they're pretty, some of the stuff you're talking about is pretty remote that very few people get to um, ever, um, let alone in their lifetimes. I mean, just seeing places and, you know, the last person that, like Henderson, for example, um, nobody ever goes there and just knowing that for miles and hundreds of miles, there's nobody around and um, this is all just you appreciating this island and nobody around. That's a, that's a pretty crazy feeling. Mm -hmm. And um, we do a lot of free diving. So since we entered the South Pacific, it's just been amazing and you dive up the boat to check the anchor or something and there's there's corals and there's fish turtles sharks whatever you want so that's a very unique advantage of the sailing life mm -hmm. okay and so oh well, that's fantastic um and what how, how did you guys then evolve to starting your youtube sailing channel what what, how, what was that about i started it when i left i knew that's what i wanted to do Mm -hmm. I was uh, inspired by Delos and La Vagabond. And this was 2016, so there wasn't like too many sailing channels that started then. Um, and I had been watching for five years. I'd been, this has been a five year goal for me. So I was working and working and working and saving up money for the boat, knowing that I wanted to do this. And I, I thought I'd, I'd try just try it, the YouTube thing and see uh, if it worked out or if it, if I didn't get any views and it was too much work, I, I just kind of slough it. But people were interested and I was going to um, the first place I went was Cuba. And I don't think anybody had really done anything on Cuba yet. And it was so cool. And you know, like all the old cars and it was neat. People were interested. 
also people love drama and i think we in the first six months we definitely yeah. had enough of that we had uh, rudders breaking off while crossing the gulf stream and yeah. you obviously you grounded the boat really badly and um people just seeing us dealing with it and fixing the boat i think um that's how we got most of our fan base that is still following us today which is mm -hmm. pretty amazing yeah i mean one of your videos has had 764,000 views, right? That's, that's the size of a small country. It's quite amazing. I don't really know how that, how that works, to tell you the truth. Some of them are, they just get a lot of views. Yeah, yeah, YouTube analytics are a hard thing to like wrap your head around. It seems pretty random at times. Mm -hmm. but. but it's so true. I mean, it's um, as much as you, you hear stories about plain sailing and and fun sailing, it's, it's, it's almost never without the drama. Um, and even when you've got your boat in great shape and everything's repaired and everything's 100%, it's only a matter of days or weeks before you have a growing list of things to fix again. Um, exactly. so, uh, it's great to share, uh, you know, what's and all, what, what, what it's really like, particularly when you're doing stuff that you're doing, which is pushing up into unusual um, destinations that probably aren't as well charted. There's a lot of locations that most people sail to. Um, not to mention some of the things you have to improvise with around around weather as well. So, what what's some of the what's some of the, the weather you've had to deal with um, today? How how how's your boat and how's your boat handled it? Weather, yeah. Um, we hit. You know, we feel pretty confident now in anything under like thirty five knots. Uh, if it gets over that on this boat because it's so light. Um, the boat starts going too fast <laughs> and often if we get hit by more than 40 it'll it'll do 16 knots like as soon as it hits and it, it's scary <laughs> and it's not something you really want to do and so we've set up um, a drogue a really long warp and um, we have a parachute anchor that ended up being too small but um, I think in, on my next boat, I'll definitely have a bigger parachute anchor and a, and a nice Jordan series drogue. I think that those two things are very, very important. But uh, as far as the weather that we've seen, we've seen like um, out to sea up to 60 knots. And that was crossing the ITCZ on this last sail, actually. We got hit, we got slammed by something. And we luckily, we were reefed down. We were as far reefed down as we could be, but we still had to take the, the sails down when it hit us and just run with bear poles. Uh, it was, Which we were still doing like 14 knots or so with that in the sail tub. Yeah, that says it was a, pretty wild. It says a lot. And, yeah, uh, and the seas, I think we've seen like 25 foot seas once before, but um, this last sail from Fanning to Hawaii, uh, the seas were big, big, mm -hmm. big. Eight, um, eight meters, nine meters, I think. Which is big about, so, in, in your type of boat, what do you do with it? Do you, do you run off? Do you, do you go to go to uh, onto a beam reach? How do you handle those kind of seas without getting yourself into a you know pitch pole broach sort of type type risk situation? Uh, we tow a, a warp, so mm -hmm. we do like a four hundred foot line tied from one cleat to uh, making a loop and tied to the other. Yeah, and that that helps a lot. And then. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'd never take the, the seas on the beam either if we can help it. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the boat kind of likes to be quartered by those kind of seas. Mm -hmm. And so that's usually what we do is we, you know, if we have to make weather and we have to go upwind, we'll, we'll go as, as long as we can. But if the sea state gets big, we, you got to turn off. Yeah. And beam on is the, you know, as you know, it's the fastest point of sail for a uh, sailboat. So you don't really want to be going super fast in that kind of weather. And with this kind of boat, it's, it's so light and so nimble and so fast that, you know, 30 knots on the beam is, it's a lot. I mean, we yeah. were, we were doing nine, 10 knots with just a postage stamp of jib out beating. And that's way too much. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, how much, um, how much does the Gary weigh? Seven tons. Seven tons. Yeah. Okay. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty, pretty lightweight in size. Yeah. And we keep it real light because uh, it, it definitely affects a boat this light. You know, we take the anchor off and put it inside the hull when we're on a longer passage than 100 miles or so, just because mm -hmm. it's it, it makes a big, big difference on the pitch pulling of the boat. 
Yeah, wait down Sorry, low. I'll be horsing. I'll be horsing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, well, that's interesting. Um, um, and so, I mean, and so you're you know you're getting on towards I guess four years into this. I mean, how do you how do you fund your sailing? How do you fund what you're able to do? Um, we were really lucky in that our YouTube channel kind of started making us money right when we ran out of our kitty. Mm -hmm. So I'm basically editing videos, um, all the episodes that we have up on YouTube. That's that's my job. That's what I'm doing. And we publish them on Patreon, which is like a, a subscription crowdfunding website, basically, where people donate um, like a dollar per video, for example. Yeah. But, and, open-ended basically like you can't give us just one but per creation we're being paid so it's a nice residual on income other than other youtube channels fund themselves by um by getting big sponsors on board but that's more like a yearly thing so it's really sweet to have like a residual income that you can actually plan ahead for the next month because you know what you're gonna have on your hands to be fixing up the boat or paying for visas and provisions and all that kind of jazz yeah. So um, we also have how-to videos, which is more like James's alley. So we do a, a couple of those a year. And yeah. <laughs> you make me sound lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I make three videos a month and James does like two a year. He does, he does the boat repairs. So um, that's how we found our balance. That's just the easiest way of doing it because you've got more experience with that and I'm better with the editing. So yeah. We're oh, being that's fantastic. Well, Pretty good team on this. Congratulations on creating a model. <laughs> that, yeah, congratulations on creating a model that's, that's working for you because uh, a lot of people think about that kind of stuff, but very few people do it, and it takes you know takes a lot of guts and takes a lot of fortitude and takes a lot of uh, you know take, takes weeks and months before sometimes before you start to see results. So the fact you've created what you have is is fantastic. Um, and also just I mean, just on that you know. You've got some great videos. I'm just, I've had a look at a few of them, not, not all of them by any means, but um, you've got some great videos. But I think a lot of people don't appreciate how much work goes into editing video before you can publish it. I mean, it's one thing just to capture it, but for a lot of people who think about, you know, oh, that's great, I've got a video channel that's kind of easy, but you know, do you want to, I guess, do you want to just explain um, how much time you have to spend editing video, you know, each half hour of footage to that's create a, a show ready video? Because it's not a five minute job. Yeah. Editing takes me about, I think, um, somewhere between 25 and 40 hours of video. It really depends on the kind of footage we have. And especially when we started, we just filmed random stuff without thinking about like a story that we could tell in an episode. So it took forever to just piece something together that just looks as if it would make sense to somebody. Yeah. To somebody. But we're getting better at it and I'm getting better at editing, which does not really um, take down the amount of hours I think the, the output, the, the product that we put out is just better at the end. Um, I really hoped that I was going to get quicker, but somehow the more you know what kind of effects you can use, the more you use them, so it takes longer. I yeah. think telling a story is the hardest part. If you, if you think about a story and then you film the story, it makes editing super easy. But if you just film a week of random stuff, it's, it makes it tough to kind of put it into a story and then put music to it and have the mood kind of flow right. Yeah, uh, that it's really, really important. I mean, we don't even think about it when we're watching videos, but to have the mood flow correctly and to have the right music for that kind of mood and, you know, to go up and down and then, you know, slow down and, and, and tell a story in a linear fashion. It's actually really difficult if you're just kind of randomly like, oh, my God, I see turtles. And then re and it's like, you know, ADD child trying to put a bunch of thoughts from his head into a documentary or something. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I feel like anyway. Well, that's a, that's a such a good explanation because I guess um, the more that you produce content, the more that when you see other movies and documentaries, you, you probably have a different, you start to have a different appreciation for how they put it together and all the captures they do from all the different angles. And oh, yeah, how absolutely. Cool. It, it really is an art and a science, isn't it? And I guess you guys are the you're kind of moving into that amateur, semi professional document, documentary, movie making type type a um, skill, I guess, because that's what, I guess that's what, what it takes, doesn't it, to actually produce something, something that people on a, on, a, on a larger scale want to consume on content-wise. It's not just one art either. It's like five arts. It's like filming is an art and photo is an art and editing is an art and storytelling is an art. I mean, it's awesome. I love to learn and I think both of us are like that, but uh, it's, <laughs> it's tough and you can, 
like you just screw up one little thing and and the youtube people are relentless like they are <laughs> oh you guys suck your microphone sucks you know it's like come on i just worked so hard on this i yeah. watched a couple of our older episodes yesterday and it's ridiculous what people have actually been putting up with <laughs> <laughs> we've really improved um our editing and filming skills and our equipment yeah. and um it's yeah it's pretty cool that with one camera and one microphone and one computer you can actually like create so many different videos and things and share them with everybody it's it's quite the amazing time that we live in yeah it's an incredible time to be alive right and you're exactly right that what we can do with technology now i mean the fact that i'm sitting here in an office in queensland in australia and you're sitting on board your yacht on a you know a tethering off a phone or a wi-fi or some sort of dongle um and the picture's really clear um but also the sound's really good um and yeah, it's funny you say some of the little things that happen when you're producing content um, that, that other people pick up. Um, I, I had a I had a, um, a guest interviewer once interview um, somebody about sailing. It was a great episode, but there was this bird chirping in the background all the way through. Um, <laughs> and the more that the more that I edited it, the more that I become more, more conscious of this bloody bird. Um, <laughs> And then when I published it, sure enough, people were like, what's that bird? Shut that bird up. You know, it's like <laughs> two hours bird. to write footage and the bird's like 90% of it's just, it's just in the background chirping all the way through. I don't know why they did the science of the bird, um, but yeah. Imagine, um, imagine like we're, we have just sailed 500 miles and we've got this beautiful place and we're explaining like something amazing is happening. And then at, right afterwards we go and check and the mic was shit. And we, it's just... <laughs> And we just yeah. can't use it. We're like, ah, that happens so much. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing the stuff that interferes um, in the background. So, um, so okay, well, that's really that's really fascinating. And so, I want to next. I want to jump into um, your most recent um, challenge, which is pretty significant, really. Um, so, so take me back to your 60, 60 nautical miles off the off the coast of Hawaii, um, and tell me tell me what what happened. Uh, well, I'll start. So what we were doing was sailing from Fanning to Hawaii and you have to go through the ITCZ, which is the, the convergence zone for the southern trade winds and the northern trade winds, the southeastern southerns and the northeastern uh, northerns. <laughs> and uh, right where those can collide, there's usually an area of doldrums like maybe it differs on different times of the year, but in the winter it's fairly thin and sometimes it just converges together. So uh, we had seen a big front that was coming above Hawaii. And this is what happens in the winter. Big fronts come above it and they kind of circle around and uh, speed up the trades from the ITCZ all the way to Hawaii and, and more. Um, so this was normal. We were expecting this. We sailed 400 miles uh, east to make some easting before turning up and not having to pinch so hard to get to Hawaii. And everything was working out fine. It was, you know, it was really windy. I, I told you we saw over over 50 knots. We don't have a wind instrument, but we know what 40 knots looks like. And this was 50 plus. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were planning on going in, cutting the inside of the big island and going up to Oahu, which turns out was the wrong thing to do. Um, I should have researched it a little more because going underneath any of those islands in Hawaii is known uh, by, the, by the islanders as being a bad idea. They always go up around, but we didn't. And uh, we were doing okay. We made it almost there. We were actually 40 nautical miles off of the big island when um, there's, a, there's a point that converges if you look on the windy charts with the wind where the big island will shield a lot of the, um, the wind, like the lee of the island is huge. And there's a point where it kind of all converges together and, and it speeds up on the bottom. And if you hit that point with your boat, I mean, talking to people now that are, that are sailors around here, they've all been in it and they're like, bro, you can get three waves that converge on one and it's like a mushroom wave that lifts your boat up. Wow. And I'm pretty sure that's what happened to us. And we got, we were seeing 25 feet, foot waves uh, all day for the last two days. Uh, normally they were 15 they, they, some of them are big and I'm pretty sure there was like some kind of triple up 30 footer 35 foot wave that just came and mushroomed our boat and it was so fast that I mean it was two waves really we were going along fine we had two drogues out we had a posted stamp of jib up 
we were doing about six knots, which was great. That's, that's fine in those kind of conditions. Uh, the wind was hitting us on our quarter, so we weren't taking it on the beam. And we just had one wave just boom, rock us. And we were like, whoa. And this is like two o'clock in the morning. Uh, we're both up because we can't really sleep really anyway. And, uh, uh, well, one of us is on watch, obviously. I don't even know who it, who it was. We were in a really weird watch rotation because we neither one of us could sleep through this this stuff. And we were almost there. I mean, another few hours, we would have been in the Lee. And we, we had got hit by one wave, and then the very next wave hit us and just dropped. It felt like it picked us up and just dropped us. And right when we hit the water, it snapped our... Our main beam failed, and subsequently the the hold hold eject joint on the inside of the catamaran failed the entire thing, and all of the bulkheads just snapped. It just basically ripped the starboard hull off the boat, wow. and it was canting out. And luckily, that was the windward side because the waves were coming underneath and hitting the other bridge deck. Had had it been the other side, it would have just filled with water and flipped the boat. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, we didn't have very much time. When I went down there, I mean, I knew something ha bad happened. And I went down there and I saw the separation. I could see the seawater through. I could see the moon reflecting through my boat. And I was like, babe, this is bad. Uh, we need, we, uh, and I was thinking, I'm like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And, and, sh and uh, I think you suggested let's tie lines around the boat. And so I, I, I redid the whole boat with Dyneema. And so I carry a um, 600 foot spool of, uh, three eighths Dyneema, big fat Dyneema, and that line. That stuff is is stronger than steel. So hmm. we wrapped that around the boat and kind of used the winches and blocks. And it took us a couple hours, but we figured out how to kind of pull the hull back in. Wow. And the only way to do that was for me to get in the water and for her to stay on the board and kind of help. You know, like here, take this and. And then it, at one point it, it slipped off and it wrapped around the um, prop and it just ripped the entire uh, strut out of the boat and bent the prop like 90 degrees, the whole prop shaft. Luckily the boat was built out of Eric's foam, which I can't say enough about, but uh, it didn't even leak. <laughs> didn't It broke the boat on the bottom, but it didn't uh, leak through, thank God, because that would have been pretty the, catastrophic. The hull, the hull itself stayed intact from the water impregnation point of view, even though the hull came away from the boat or started to break away from the boat, you didn't, didn't have water coming into it. Yeah, and the deck now was the only thing holding the boat together because, you know, the, here's the catamaran hulls, one's like this, and the deck's holding the, the boat together, but the deck's broken too. We, it's, it's completely broken. It's just basically this fiberglass. So every time we take a wave, even with it tied together, it would stress I mean, the creaking was horrible. Ugh. It would stress the boat, and then all the water would pour in from the broken deck and the cracks and stuff. And so it was like every minute for 12 hours, we were like, boom, water. It was just horrible. It was, it was horrible. Worst night. We had the parachute anchor out to kind of point us into the waves. Another and problem. whenever that worked, we were okay because um, – we were just riding them basically and it was mm -hmm. relatively comfortable but um it, ke it kept on failing on us and it turns out that it was not the right parachute anchor that was just like kind of a custom version and never again will i go out to sea without a properly sized and properly set up parachute anchor because that thing helped immensely even though even with it not working correctly it was really good to have and um, yeah, every time we would side the waves because the parachute anchor would collapse and turn on itself, um, things got things got bad, and uh, it was really scary. I was really scared for the boat, and we talked to the coast guard, and they suggested sending down a helicopter, and they suggested um, having a cutter come down to us. We were in the middle of nowhere though, because the big island doesn't have any facilities from the coast guard. So they had to come from Oahu, which was like 170 miles away. So it took they took their time coming down, even though they were they like didn't take their time. into waves at like 20 knots. And yeah, <laughs> they yeah. all got seasick to come and save us. But it took time because they were so far. So we, I, I ordered uh, Prepare to Abandon Ship because... We both of us talked about it, and by the time it got light, we had the situation under control, but we were still in 20-foot seas, and 
the boat was so scarily, I mean, we had, um, we had those, those ropes that we tied around parted twice and we had to get back in the water and do it again. That was how bad this sea state was. Yeah. And we decided, we decided we, we didn't want to be on the boat anymore. We were done. I was exhausted. We couldn't winch anymore. We couldn't hold a rope anymore. And we decided we were done. But at that point, we had just drifted into the lee of the island and the seas started getting better. And the, um, the sun came out, charged our batteries. We were able to start the engine. And it was going to be another nine hours before the Coast Guard got there. So by the time the Coast Guard got there to take us off the boat, which we initially wanted to do, we were like, you know what? We can, we're fine now. We can get, it, get her into port. And it just like perfect timing kind of thing. Yeah, they arrived at night and they were like, the seas are too sketchy to help you guys, but we'll escort you. And that alone just was a huge help to know that in case these lines part, which they could do because we were not able to set up any chafing protect, uh, protection good enough. Yeah. So just knowing that if all hell breaks loose, they'll be there and to save us, that was very um, encouraging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's pretty good for them to escort you like that because I've heard of scenarios where um, boats have been you know, lost their masts and Coast Guard comes out and says, get off now, um, you know. Um, we can't bring you fuel. We can't tow your boat. So you either get off now and leave your boat, or you, um, or you stay on your boat and we've got to carry on to the next job. So the fact that they could stay with you like that, so that you could save your boat, but um, know that help was right there if it all came apart. Because the concept of, I mean, it's it's probably it's, it's easy to discuss this in the space of a few minutes, but being out there in the dark at night in a big sea state like that, and then getting in the water in the dark to try and lash a hull that's coming apart on a catamaran to the main body of the boat. I mean, that's a hugely scary thing to do. And you can have a hole come down on your head and, you know, crush your head and knock you out and drown you. And it's not, it's not for the yeah, first time. To. Most people aren't going to get in the water and do that. Um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty incredibly brave and courageous thing to do. Um, it really is. Well, it's our home. We wanted to save it. It was the only way. There's mm -hmm. no other way to do it. I mean, we tried to use the boat hook to get, I didn't want to get in the water. It was scary as shit. And then when I got in the water, I had to hold on to the boat because the sea states were so big that the, the hull was coming up so fast and the water was rushing into the place where it was displacing it, that it was trying to suck me under the boat and then smash me. Yeah. So I literally had, I, I let go a couple of times because I had to feed, feed it around and holy moly, man, I, I almost got killed a couple of times, man. Yeah. You don't want to ever have to do that. I wouldn't want to ever put anybody in that position, but um, there was no other choice. We would have ended up both in the water. I mean, if it would have parted and flipped us, then... The boat was going to flip, this for was... sure. I mean, had had we just left it, 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 a wave would have just gotten in between that bridge deck joint and filled the hole with water, and then as soon as that happened, it would have flipped. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, I mean, in your case, what, what, what was plan B if, if you weren't able to to hold all together like you did, what was plan B if you had to get off? What was the next step? Uh, we had our dinghy, it's an unsinkable dinghy. Um, OC tender. No, it's not inflatable, but it's like a, it's a composite dinghy. And uh, yeah, we would have totally gotten into our OC tender. And that was a, that was a huge relief also knowing that, that we have a backup basically. Yeah. So these guys had just given us this dinghy in um, Tahiti, like two months before this. We were we were doing two and a half years with a little porta boat, and this dinghy, oh, man, made us just our peace of mind. I don't want to sell the dinghy to you, but badass. Check them out. <laughs> OC tenders. <laughs> One. <laughs> uh, well, that's good. I mean, it's always good to get advice on products from people that have used them. That's those are the best endorsements, and um, so that always. It always helps when people listen to the stuff and um and it always helps when people are making choices and you know it's always you, you, it's not until you need to use something under stress or under load that you really appreciate you know what's what will do the job from what probably won't do the job sometimes because it's easy for all of us um you know to take for example you know an undersized um droves on board and not really appreciate that when you need something to do the job you need you need the right piece the right tool um in those conditions because sometimes you don't have a second chance to get the right right sort of total system in place well i've got a 
I've got a Jordan series drogue. I've never used it, but I've got it. And it's, you know, I, I liked it on and off the boat for the Sydney Hobart race. And, you know, it's peace of mind. You now you've got the, the right thing for the job. You know it's going to work because you do, at the time when you buy the stuff, um, you often don't think too much about it. Um, but when you know you need it, the conditions are usually pretty adverse. You know, um, speaking of that, if we can just dive into that for a, one second, um, this is what I've learned from this. Uh, there's a lot of um, conflicting information about the use of sea anchors and drogues uh, uh, comparatively on multi hulls and on uh, mono hulls. Some people say it's, it's bad, some people say you should run. If you are disabled and you were taking big waves, having a working sea anchor is the most important thing. Uh, just to give you a, 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 what happened with us is our sea anchor was too small and it was turning on itself. It was, it was like collapsing and right. then it would, it, would, it would catch and it would turn us into the waves and then it would collapse and we'd be taking waves beam on because catamarans just go beam on to the wind. Uh, had we had a sea anchor, it would have been so much more comfortable, so much easier, so much easier on the boat. We wouldn't have had to get in the water three times to repair parting lines. I'll never go out to sea again uh, without a, a good sea anchor. And that is, uh, the problem with ours is, it, one, it was too small, and the other, it was a converted old parachute that somebody had just put strapping on, and the strapping was was like, it was folding over itself and the strapping was was getting really really tangled to the point where we pulled it in all 400 feet of it four times that's wow. how tired we were and tried to get it untangled and get it reset it was impossible so what i would recommend is just for those situations where you don't know you're going to be disabled or you're trying to ride out a hurricane or something like that uh the the drogue that you need is a super big very very heavy webbing hopefully some kind of a ring on the end that keeps it from uh, getting too tangled up. And um, I think para anchor, this, the professional ones that, that you buy those, I'm, they're, I'm not going out to sea with a, a per good parachute anchor again. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good advice. We make, um, YouTube videos and um, we have like this paid, this community on Patreon, like our closest supporters. And we told them about our problem with the RC anchor. So they all like, gave us like their wealth of knowledge and we're like oh this is obvious you used to run sea anchor and way undersized so that was really cool we learned a lot from that because people were able to share their experiences with us and tell us how we could have done better and we will be doing better next time mm -hmm. okay and so i mean it's it's a incredible story in the sense that you want to survive which is you know you obviously the plan being yeah, able to survive but the fact that you the fact that you manage to hold your boat together and then limp all the way to port. I mean, what's where, where to next for you um, with Zingaro? Is it repairable? Are we selling it? Are you going to yes. buy something else? What's the plan? It's repairable, but um, we're never going to trust it again. Mm. And we want to do some higher latitude work. I mean, mm -hmm. we got really lucky that we broke down here. Um, we want to go to Japan. We want to go to Alaska. We want to do the Great Circle route and come down, do Patagonia. We met a bunch of people in, in Easter Island that had just come from Chile. And that area is just one of the be most beautiful places. And we want to see it and we want to get a, um, a stronger boat. So unfortunately, we're going to have to retire Zingaro, which is really sad for us to say. It's, it, it's our home and it's our, our friend and our, you know, we've taken such good care of it. And you really get to know your boat when you, yeah. when you live on put a lot of miles on it but she's just not fit for the kind of sailing that we're doing exactly so we were talking about going to japan and alaska and we still want to do that but even before this incident we i think knew that zingara was not the right boat for that so our plan b was to go to the marquesas and then um, sail down basically the milk run to new zealand and australia and um yeah, I think sooner we would have gotten a, a different boat anyways to do the sailing that we want to do. Like, mm -hmm. This is just not the right boat for ice, for example. Like, nah, nah. <laughs> um, okay, and um, so and what's um and what what have you got in mind? Like, what's the next? What's the next sort of 
Is it another catamaran? Is it a monoha? What, what, what do you got in mind? Well, because we're, um, we had a lot of our money invested in the boat, uh, we're not going to probably be able to afford a good cruising catamaran. Uh, maybe if we can work a deal out with, with uh, a company or someone, but um, it looks like maybe we're going to be switching to a monohull. Like the polar opposite, something heavy, something steel, aluminum, something like <laughs> heavy duty. Yeah. Um, Hopefully that it's, it still sails well. Yeah. But yeah. I think, and I've had a, a few monohulls before. This is my fourth boat. Mm -hmm. So this next one will be my fifth. I'll go, I'll go back. I've never cruised on one and I've always made fun of all the monohull boaters. So it's going to be tough going back. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to. That'll that'll be a whole new learning curve. One of the things we really like about having a catamaran is we can go to an offshore island and tie to a rock. And even if the swell and we get a little bit of fetch, we're still relatively stable and can sleep. So we might have to change our our cruising uh, idea and how we cruise. I, I'm not really sure. Maybe we can engineer a good flopper stopper or something. We'll make it work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. Um. Yeah, I, um, I often envy the, the catamaran sitting on an anchorage when you're rolling around a bit um, in a monohull. But I've got um, I've got these um, stabilizers I bought a couple of years ago. I think they're by a company called Manta. And you, the, you, you, you push the boom out one side of your boat and you push the, you put the spinning pole out the other side and you suspend these. They're like a folding rectangular plate. They're about a meter long, um, about, you know, maybe a foot. The two plates are about a foot, foot wide. And they're hinged in the middle, and as the plate goes down, it goes down like a book. And as, as the boat starts to roll the other way, the plate opens up like a book, and as it goes to lift, it stabilizes the boat. Um, well, I, I can put one of those out each side, and it stops about 90% of the roll. Um, if I had just one out one side, it probably stops 70%, but it's really effective, um, especially when you go to some of those islands you go to where there's always an ambient sea swell, no matter which side of it you're on, there's always something just rolling through it enough to be kind of annoying. Um, or if you side onto the swell, because you know you hit the wind, but um, so that if you have to, you know, come down a level to a minor hole, um, maybe. It <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't really think of it as um, coming down. I think of it as you know a, a new learning learning experience, cruising on a mono hole, and uh, we'll, we'll make it work. I just don't want to have to alter our cruising too much because yeah. we're we've really been going out and seeing like super out of the way. Like if there's a rock in the middle of nowhere and we can tie onto it, we can do it on the, on the cat. Yeah. And I, I just hope that we can figure out a way to have some of that on a monohull. But, but the more importantly, and what people don't really realize is, you know, sailing this far on a little plywood light race catamaran, uh, performance catamaran, I should say, um, is scary. It's it, at night. I, I never really slept, sleep well. It, it's uh, any big sea or, or um, bridge deck slap kind of wakes you up. Um, yeah. It, it's not really a nice way to do a passage. And I'm really looking forward to a big, heavy train going through the water where we can just, you know, if we go through a squall, we just reef the, reef the sails and then get inside and ride it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I mean, I've got a, my I've got a Benito, which is you know, 1992, 45 foot, 12 tons, probably was loaded with gear, um, 10.3 tons empty, and um, even even the last couple of months, I've been out in some um, some five to six meters. So what's that? You know, 15 to 20 odd foot seas and 40 knots, and just reef it right down, um, and then you just truck off downwind surfing wave after wave and just as long as it's not over canvas it's just so stable it almost it almost feels like it sells better in 30 to 40 knots sometimes and in 15 knots not just just because you've got the drive to drive you through the sea state sometimes if you're in 10 knots and you're rolling around in a big sea state it's you know there's not enough power to drive the boat it can be quite uncom uncomfortable but when you really get it get it set the right sail area you do actually you kind of revel in those conditions because um, the boat really enjoys it um, but, and you sleep well um, but the only time I haven't slept well was um, doing some solo stuff and needing to go upwind and it didn't matter whether I was 30 degrees 40 degrees 50 degrees 60 degrees every tenth wave is kind of hollow and I'd fall off the back of it and that's when you're on it you're in at night 
downstairs, you know, and you're 100, 300 miles offshore, that's not a very nice sound. No matter how strong the boat is, I, I hate that sound of the boat crashing off waves. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. But yeah, so that's, uh, I mean, the yeah, I mean, you can probably get a, a mid-weight kind of monohull that's kind of still do, still average six, six to seven knots. So, you know, you can still do respectable kind of distances. But I, yeah, I hear, I've heard of some people with a, big heavy steel boats and they kind of average three to four knots and I think I, I couldn't go that slow though. <laughs> Don't <laughs> it, tell us that man. Psychologically, <laughs> psychologically knowing you've done a hundred miles you know on a good day and 50 miles on a bad day or something that'd be terrible. Um, oh so, god yes oh my god. It's, it's nice to take down the miles particularly if you're trying to get ahead of weather or, or you just want to get mm -hmm. there. Um, so but it's good I mean you're there is a lot of choices um, and there's a lot of options for lots of different budgets as well for monohulls um, and probably Structurally wise, you know, there's probably, um, you know, there's probably less risk with monohulls. I'm, I'm generalizing. You can get a range of monohulls budget wise that'll be still be fundamentally sound, but you can get a range of catamarans budget wise. And if you're not careful, um, they're not structurally sound um, because of the age of them or the design of them or price them. So, yeah, it's probably a good compromise, at least for the next leg of your, uh, your journey um, and your adventures. Yeah, I think the most important thing is for us to get a strong boat that's very sound, very structural, like one piece mold if it's a cat. Yeah. Uh, it's that's that's really all we're looking for. It doesn't matter if it's a catamaran or a monohull, it just has to be something that we can never break in half again. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's that's a good that's a good goal. Um, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, with a monohull, my, my fear has always been is, is the keel falling off in, in the dark in, in the middle of the night. Um, but yeah, structural failure. I mean, you can pretty much deal with anything, but if your boat breaks in half or you, in a monohull's case, the keel falls off and it rolls upside down, you know, that's that's one thing I don't know. You know, it doesn't matter how much you practice it, dealing, dealing with that in a big sea state, that would be a, that'd be a horrible situation to be in. So if you've got yeah. lots of people inside you trying to get out. So yeah, it's having structural confidence, like you say, you can sleep at night and enjoy the trip. Yeah, and you can mitigate a lot of that, but um, what you can't mitigate is the, um, the the way that the boat is put together. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so I mean, you've you've had an amazing um, amazing time since twenty sixteen, um, <coughs> and. Um, got some pretty exciting plans in terms of where to next and what what's what is the immediate future hold for you now what <laughs> excuse me <coughs> sorry um what's the immediate future hold and what do you what, what have you got on your plate right now that you're you're having to deal with and where to next in the next sort of two or three months uh well we're we're going to haul the boat out we found a yard here in maui uh that'll be cheap enough where we can set it down clean it up and get it ready for sale. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're going to sell it as a uh, <laughs> storm damaged boat. You know, I'm sure we'll find somebody that it probably needs about 20 grand of work. But you know, if we sell it for 15 and you and you put 20 into it, you got an 80 thousand dollar boat for 35 grand. Yeah, and someone will be able to learn and work and do the do the the necessary repairs to beef it up and and structurally make this boat sound. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a sweet boat if you disregard the fact that one hall is about to rip off. <laughs> so somebody will, will make a nice home out of this or maybe like a coastal cruiser, maybe maybe like a weekend and sailor, something like that is what we're hoping for, for Zingara's future. Um, and then we're starting a Kickstarter campaign that's launching Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be a fundraising campaign. Um, we're going to be selling, basically selling art and some prints and some um, pr uh, printed on metal art from our travels. So I don't know if you have checked out our Instagram page, but um, we have some pretty sweet pictures on there, if I may say so myself. And people have been asking us to um, sell high quality prints of those for a while now. So we plan on doing that to fund uh, buying a radar and a heater for Japan. And now <laughs> we'll need a, a new boat. So we altered the plan a little and we're gonna sell more and better prints basically. Okay. Yeah. And also, you go. We're also gonna have some spots on the boat available. Um, and a new boat. <laughs> 
basically we're going to be kind of inviting people up to the boat for a donation basis and so we're, we're going to try to find a boat that's real comfortable for four like two couples maybe yeah. something 45 foot rate like yours i'm sure you have a, a good two cabin setup yeah it's got three um which is good because yeah. um i can either use all three or i could just use the ford cabin which i often do for sale and gear storage and keep the, the two aft cabins free um for for crew um so and the saloon works quite well too in terms of a couple of extra bunks um in fact it's probably the best place on the boat is the saloon in the center of the boat on the passage it feels like yeah a bit sometimes um yeah so it gives you that that versatility really um which will which will help make make it all work so um so i'll link to you i'll link to you from the ocean sailing podcast uh podcast page where this episode is published but also from the Facebook group as well. So what? So what are the best? Um, what are the best um, sites or social media locations to link to for you? Because uh, you've got oh, definitely YouTube. Yeah, you, so got- you, YouTube is our number one social media. And then if people want to help, Patreon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's the best way to help us. Is just you know a dollar a dollar an episode. You're giving us you know uh, something that's going to help us keep this going and keep filmmaking and and we'll we'll that's where we're posting all our updates and like behind the scenes stuff so if people are interested in what's going to happen with us in the next couple of weeks or months or over yeah. the next parts of the next years that's where we're keeping people posted okay and um and just for, for everybody listening to this been able to look at your previously published videos on the youtube channel absolutely fascinating um and you know the Work that you do helps inspire others to do to go sailing, and but also some of the locations you've been to. You know, giving giving people an insight into those when they'll never get there themselves, maybe, um, or they're thinking of going there. Um, you know, all, all that work really helps other sailors um, and helps helps people with their knowledge and confidence, and helps inspire people um, to do things they may not have planned to do. Um, I got a somebody um, emailed me um, a couple of months ago saying that they're their dad had owned a boat for 10 years and had been sitting in the shed for 10 years. And uh, because of listening to the podcast and some of the stories like yours, he's finally decided to start working on his boat and he's committed yeah. to getting into the water in the next 12 months. Um, and they're really excited because it's sat in the shed for 10 years, sat there doing nothing. And he keeps saying, oh, next year, next year, now he's inspired. So, you know, you help inspire people to do stuff like that. So it's great. Nicely done, brother. Nicely done. Way to inspire. It's, it feels so good to, to get those kind of emails. We get those every once in a while. And man, it makes all the work worth it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, it does. It does. And it's good. It's, it's, it is fulfilling, that's for sure. Um, so, um, I mean, before we wrap up, what, what else do you want to share? What else, what, what other lessons do you want to share? Or what are you know, some, what are some, of, some of the highlights of your most favorite places you've you've traveled to that that are a little bit more out of the way that you want to share with others because um you know it's I, I could talk to you for hours um and people could probably listen to you for hours so it's easy to kind of skip over the places you've been and things you've done and and, and you know not spend time on them but you know uh, you know it's, it's it's just all these little things are fascinating to learn more about so um, if you have some time you have favorite place, anything you can... um Fanning Island in the Line Island group or Carrier Bash was super special, um, very remote. And how many people lived there? I think 2000. So, something about that and in a very traditional way. So it was way different than anything we, we had ever seen before. Like all the people were, there was the sense of community there was just unlike anything I've ever seen before and they were all weaving baskets and mats and the houses they built they all built together and they were all open so if you walk through the village at night you could see the lights and all the houses and like literally look into everybody's um, living room and uh, sleeping quarters and just that was beautiful mm-hmm. um my advice for people that are watching David's podcast or listening is don't worry about not knowing everything. You don't have to know everything when you leave. Um, take me, for example, if you watch some of my old videos, I didn't know anything. I, I, I lost stuff that you shouldn't lose on your boat and just figured out by uh, friends, mentors, the mentors will, will come. There's always other boaters that'll help you out. It's a really tight knit community. 
and you don't have to know everything. Like you, it's part of it just to learn as you go. And you know, in the last three years, I've seen some amazing, amazing things and learned some amazing things. I've grown as a person and as, as a sailor. Uh, it, it, for instance, now we don't have any problem going to the most remote island, 500 miles offshore, tying to a rock right outside the surf and free diving with sharks to get our dinner, trying to spear them off you so you get the fish instead of them. And to say that now, if, if you would have told me I was, I'd be doing that three years ago when I left, you know, and I was worried about the 90 mile passage to Cuba, I would have, I would have told you you're crazy. <laughs> but uh, learning all those things, it comes and other people will help you and you'll, you'll get it. And uh, hopefully you won't have to destroy your boat in this process. But I mean, even if you do, it's not the end of the world, if, you know, as long as everybody's safe. And that was you, the most beautiful that thing that came out for me out of this whole story the support of all our followers has been pretty amazing but being able to say our boat ripped in half and the lifetime saving are gone but it was still worth it and there's no way we're going to stop now that's just the most beautiful thing i would do it again yeah if you told me that my boat was gonna rip in half but i'd get to experience all these things some of the things for instance that you want uh we spent 34 days in easter island we saw people that came there and spent three days and they just didn't like the way that their boat was rolling and they took off. But we, we dealt with it. And of course we have a cat that's a little bit more stable, but it really wasn't a big difference there. Um, a magical place, magical place. It's not that hard to get to, especially from Ecuador. And if anybody's been ever been thinking, you know, I should do a little more adventurous sailing. Beautiful. I mean, I almost don't want to give this secret away, but that was one of the best places I've ever experienced in my life. The locals were so inviting and giving and just, we felt like we were part of a family there. And then the, there was amazing things every day. We went into caves and saw these old statues and just, it was like an adventure every day. Yeah, for sure. That's Great dive through fishing. It's a good example and it's a good point as well. It's very easy to spend a whole lot of time getting somewhere and you've only just arrived and you're you know, planning to depart and to move on and to invest you know, 34 days and really getting to know people and you know, the history and you know, understand the lie of the land and, and to really, really truly experience it. It's an amazing thing to do because um, you know, that's really what sailing is about, right? Just to, to take the time to enjoy the journey, not just race off to the next destination. So um, the fact that you did that um, is, is fantastic. It's a great example because it's just, it's just too easy to take off three or four highlights and move on and never really see somewhere or never really get to understand the people. So yeah, mm -hmm. great example. Exactly. And I'd, I'd also recommend to anybody that's cruising or that wants to cruise, uh, learn the local language or at least enough and um, meet the locals and take them out sailing. And the rewards that you will get from that are hundredfold i mean we've been to places that cruisers aren't allowed to go just because we got invited from you know a family member that we had taken sailing or we've had so many cool experiences that we would never have gotten had we not just opened up our boat and opened up our home and and our said hearts. and our hearts and said hey you know bring your bring your kids let's go I, you've never been on a sailboat perfect i would love to take you sailing <laughs> that's a really good that's a really good example yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that you can share with anybody, um, you know, and no matter what age they are, um, it has the same wow factor, doesn't it? Because we've never sailed before. So it's, yeah, it's a great one. Oh, it's beautiful. It's, it's a really great example. Um, so just uh, say, so how old are you guys? Just for people listening to this, because you know, you've got a lot of sailing ahead of you. Um, how old are you I'm guys? 39. Mm -hmm. I'm 22. Wow. So yeah, so you got decades ahead of you. So if anybody's listening to this thinking, um, you know, it's, um, I'm too young to get started or uh, I'm too old to get started. It doesn't really matter when you start. Um, mm -mm. And, um, you know, I think it's one of those things where you, you learn probably 90% of what you need to know in the first year. And then you spend the rest of your life trying to figure out the last 10%, but you, you can never do that. <laughs> <laughs> and you never really like know. <laughs> you never really know. That's the beautiful part it's, about this yeah. life. And if you keep doing different no stuff. One, no one is an expert. Uh, even Skip Novak is still getting pounded by 60 knots and crazy seas. And Yeah, that's right. And you, and people, it's, it's an amazing community for people sharing your knowledge. Um, but also, if you keep 
doing new stuff like you are, then you, you just kind of keep learning so many things for the first time. Um, and you, know, you learn anything, oh, next time I'll know that, but that, that next time might not roll around for 10 years, the exact same <laughs> circumstances. Um, so yeah, I think it's good advice. Um, you can never, you, you can just, you can never push off too soon really, um, but you can wait too long um, if you think that you need to, to know more and read more and learn more before you go. You just, you just don't. Even if you could put, read it all in a textbook, you'd never retain it. Um, even if you could read all about it before you left, you can never retain it, you never remember it. So, so it's good. Well, that's, um, that's fantastic, uh, James. And can be so good to meet you both. And for anybody listening to this on the podcast, I've also captured this by video using Zoom. So I'll publish the video to um, the Facebook, the Ocean Sailing Podcast Facebook group, and I'll publish it to the, the YouTube channel as well. So that for those of you who want to meet these guys, and um, it's probably quite a good video to watch because um, I'm not sure if you gathered from listening to it, but... Uh, James is using kind of hands to describe. <laughs> I was trying to tell him. <laughs> the howls and how they kind of look at the angles <laughs> when they broke. So you kind of seeing this thing as kind of body language will help you understand, understand the picture. Usually. I'm excited. I'm an excitable person. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I am too. I am too. Uh, so it's good. So, um, well, that's, um, that's really fantastic. And um, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, email you details and stuff um, once it's published. Um, but I'd love to stay in touch as well. So, um, you know, um, be good to when you're when you when you get through the current sort of current stage of, of the current sort of chapter, and you you know you're on your way to figure out what's next and ready to take the next step. I'd love to pick up with you and do an update on 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 where you're next for you guys, because I'm sure you've got lots of chapters and lots of ventures ahead of you over the years. So, uh, and I'm sure this like like you say this this one you know this well, once one door closes, another door opens. Uh, it's amazing you know, what comes along. And so if you can, if you're listening to this and you, you can help uh, James and Kimmy in any way, I'll, I'll link to their um, Patreon and, and YouTube from the podcast website and from the social media channels. Um, but um, I'll put your contact email details into the website as well, if you like, so if anyone wants to contact you directly. Um, cool. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate okay. that. Really nice to meet you, man. You're, you're a cool guy. I hope we can um, uh, go, share a sale when we get to Australia. Australia. <laughs> I love that. That would be fantastic. I love that. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm around Australia regularly um, and New Zealand two at times. And my um, my yacht's currently down in Tasmania and Hobart. Um, well, awesome. They've tied up for three weeks. Um, I just did the Sydney Hobart race cool. and uh, they head back down there in uh, less than three weeks now. And then um, I'm going to spend uh, early February starting around Tasmania, circumnavigating um, that, which is about 800 miles, um, but it should be some. Wow. Pretty amazing coastline, um, oh. and the the western side of Tasmania is where a lot of prevailing weather comes from. So you've got to really, got to really time your run down that western, southwestern side because it can get some some big sort of ten plus meter seas around there and fifty knot winds um, around there. So um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. It's like a two week kind of, you know, a bit of sailing, a bit of stopping, a bit of a, but you know, probably got to average um, maybe about sixty miles a day or something for two weeks. So yeah, it should be should be should be good. So um, yeah, that's that's the next chapter for me. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, pretty tough sailing grounds I hear. So be careful, reef early, and <laughs> if you need crew, you got two of us, man. Any time. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Yeah, well, hopefully I can capture some good uh, good footage from that to share as well. But yeah, it's it's definitely one of those take it easy, reef early places because uh, the, because it's quite a long way south. The winds are uh, the the air is so much denser. So getting hit with a 20 knot gust down there is probably like getting hit with a 30 knot gust on the Gold Coast. It's amazing how much difference wow. with a, the, the increased air density with a cooler air. I never really appreciated uh, that until the sailmaker told me about it. Um, that, that, you know, it's 20 knots is not always the same in one location to another because of the, the air density. So you've got to... Wow. Yeah, I didn't know. You get a 20 knot gust and you think, gosh, that's 35 knots. And you look at the, the wind dial and it says, those, you know, 18 to 20 knots in the cell. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, definitely it's, it's not a race, so it's, uh, it will definitely be reefing early and taking it easy because um, it's amazing how fast your boat moves in those kind of um, higher higher latitudes, um, even with a little amount of sail up, you know. Um, yeah. Even monoholes get along pretty well uh, in those conditions. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what we're hoping for. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, well, that's great, guys. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, great to meet you. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. And I can't wait to get this episode out um, 
for the next uh, week or so before I get away again for a couple of weeks. So, um, I'll oh yeah, have a blast, man! I'm super jealous. Take some footage and let's stay in touch. Let's okay. stay in touch. Sounds good. Thanks, James. Thanks, Kimmy. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye. Have a nice night. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Hi, folks. I hope you enjoyed episode 81 with uh, James and Kimmy and uh, Mason couple. They're the real deal. Uh, some great adventures and some great stories. And I really encourage you, just uh, out of interest, um, to check out some of their social media information. Go to their website, svzingaro.com. Go to Patreon, look up SV Zingaro, uh, or go to YouTube, uh, where you'll find their channel. Some great videos they've been publishing now for more than three years. Um, go check them out. And if you feel inspired by them, go support them as well. And I'll link to all of those links off the ocean sailing podcast.com forward slash podcast page. Um, and I'll share some of that content in the Facebook group, Ocean Sailing Podcast uh, group as well. So check those out and enjoy. Um, see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to david at ocean sailing podcast dot com dot au see you next week if you'd like to find out more about joining me on board ocean gym my beneteau 45 for an upcoming ocean race ocean passage or regatta go to ocean sailing podcast.com check out the calendar we've got some great stuff coming up up and down the east coast of australia and then an exciting race across the tasman that we'll see happen for the first time in decades from sydney to auckland in february 2021 Thanks, folks. Catch you soon. So turn around and hear them speak. So turn around and help them out. Turn around because you're watching them cry. And watching some getting ready to die. Then knocked down to the ground and can't get back up. Feelings are sad. I want to be mad. Days here are like precious gold. If you live another one, you have faith to carry on. So turn around and hear them speak. So turn around. Turn around, cause you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready to die The memory of their courage is taped in my head It plays a soft one too I painted a picture Picture cold, dark sand and skies. I painted the future how it's supposed to be with warm sun and a bright town. So turn around and hear them speak. So turn around. Some getting ready to die